Hey, Jeffrey. Hi. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> Still hot in New York? It's cooled off. <clears throat> oh, again. Yeah, it's nice and breezy now. We got a lot of rain. Still relatively hot here, though. Yeah. <laughs> it's weird. <laughs> it is weird. I love it and I hate it, you know? <laughs> There's a, there is something thrilling about it. I was out in Brooklyn and uh, at the, the library yesterday. We had a, a very warm, bright sunny day. I went inside to get a book and I came out and there was these big angry th clouds, you know, with lightning flash. And I ran to the subway and 30 seconds away from the subway, I got stuck in this little cul-de-sac with all this traffic and the rain started to pour. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when you get these, God damn it, why does this all, you know, I was like I, 30, I was 30 seconds away from safety. And if I had made it, I would have been dry and I would have had a very comfortable ride home. As it was, I got soaked. So I think that's what, you know, these thunderstorms, they come and they go in the summer. It's, they're thrilling to watch, but they're not fun to get caught in. They're meant to make your life messy, you know. That's right, that's right. <laughs> throw, throw us off center, you know. There was, then you, uh, there then was you one find out who you really are, you know. There was one day it rained twice in, in the same day, and both times, I went out the moment I, I was already down the road when the rain started. And so I could, you know, it was, do I go back or do I go forward? <laughs> Both and times I got soaked in one day. <laughs> and you never have your umbrella, right? When you need it. I'm too proud to wear, to bring out my umbrella all the time because it's such a hassle to drag around. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Hi, Marco. Hi, Doug. Hello. Howdy. Hey, Doug. Hey, Marco. Maybe wait for a few minutes. I'm sure Katina wants to join us, so. Uh, I hope we got the time straight this time. Everyone yeah. knows it's at noon, right? Yeah, Mary's um, away this week and for the next few weeks, so she won't be here anyway, but. Uh, um, and I'm going to badger Jocelyn and see if I can get her to come, but uh, um, I have a meeting with her afterwards and so on. She probably needs to be coaxed into it. She she will feel, oh, I'm not sure that uh, other people will want to hear me or whatever. So I'll, I'll need to coax her into it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and also for, I mean, it, it's she's quite vivacious, though. She, yeah. She's, uh, it, she's and. and here. Uh, yeah, and uh, but there is a thing about language, so it's not obvious to everybody who's English speaking, but for many of the people who don't speak English as their first language, it's always a bit, what's the word, um, not embarrassing, but it's a bit difficult to overcome the barrier to speak. I mean, Jocelyn, as you say, is quite vivacious, but that doesn't mean to say she doesn't have her insecurities around language, so... Mm. Uh, I mean, getting my students to take part in this kind of thing is really, really difficult because, uh, well, young people are even more sensitive to the issue than, than as we get older. So uh, they don't, and, and Quebecois in particular, never want to make mistakes in public. <laughs> so they don't want to, hi Donna, they don't want to say, uh, um, you know, they don't want to, to, to blurt out something and have it be wrong and then be laughed at. That's what they're worried about. But I mean, nobody's going to laugh at them, you know, but. Uh. Yeah, I, I, it, I can see though how it can be a barrier. I mean, I, I've gotten used to it for the most part, but the first, I don't know, 20, 30 or 40 times that we did these kinds of conversations, I was incredibly self-conscious and <laughs> I, I, I did them in spite of how I felt. Uh, yeah. So I could understand the resistance or the reluctance that people might feel to, you know, participating in this way. Uh, I, I feel that way too. Um, but I also find myself, um, when I feel like I'm at that, um, I'll let somebody else talk kind of thing and nobody does and they last forever. <laughs> I say, okay, I'm just gonna go chime in and whatever is on the top of my head, I'm going to say it. And it gives, I think, a, it just breaks the ice a little bit. 
Um, I think when people see that no one's going to get shot down for anything they say, and that there's, there's a lot of tolerance, I think it creates a lot more courage. To I come. agree. They, they need to, but they need to put their, their big toe into the water right. or their little toe into the water. <laughs> then, then when you see it's comfortable, you dive right in. <laughs> Maybe watching a few as well as part of what people do. Uh, you know, like they get, they get comfortable by just uh, the, um, you know, the, uh, the lurking. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. And, and yeah, so in a way, we can like show that it is okay just by virtue of doing what we're doing and how we do it. I think we kind of model that, you know. Um, I hope we could anyway. And we can disagree <clears throat> passionately. Even, but, yet, but it, it can be graceful as well. So. But but when once we're recorded, we have become the authority. And so, you know, so because people, some people have this authority issue where, you know, those are the experts and not I little old me here. So as soon as you're up on the video, you become an expert if that's the kind of approach that you're taking. And so it become it still becomes a problem, mm. um, you know. But I feel that that's not the approach we're taking exactly. I mean, I, I, I try to be relatively transparent about how little I know about you know, a lot of things. Yeah, um, true enough. <laughs> and like, you know, I think nobody here is posing as an expert in Octavia Butler studies or something like that. I mean, we're, just, uh, we're just passionate readers perhaps, and you know, maybe have opinions or perspectives or um, feelings about what we read. But that doesn't make us authorities really. Um, no. I so, think, I, I, mean, I, I just, I believe I'm getting, to, I'm becoming a better reader because of my participation in many of these study groups. Because um, now I'm able to tackle stuff that a year ago was daunting. And now I can finish it in like, you know, one sitting. I, I just finished um, Deleuze and Guattari, What is Philosophy? And I started it and stopped it many times. But I, I read the whole thing in like two days. And I liked it. I enjoyed it. It was fairly <laughs> riveting. And I want to read other things by Deleuze and Guattari because they've stumped me many times. You know? So I think it's, even though some of us might, as I have, complain about Schlotterdijk or complain about Aurobindo, it really does train you, I think, to handle very odd and weird ideas. And um, so that's my thumbs up. And I give myself an A plus. <laughs> I could give myself a gold star. I don't have to wait for anyone else. <laughs> Although um, uh, Butler is not hard to read, but um, one of the interesting things about reading Butler in a group is is um, my reading of Butler, it, it, it gains this thickness that when I read it on my own, I, I mean, I, I don't notice half what you guys notice, you know, so. I, th I love the, re the group reading because I think it gives a real depth and thickness to the reading process, right? So. I totally agree, yeah. So maybe we should just start because um, Katina will probably join us when she can. Um, she may have one of her commitments. Uh, hopefully she hasn't uh, uh, gotten mixed up about the time again, but. Uh, any, any, I don't have anything planned as a structure for today. Um, we started a conversation last time. We have some online discussion about the role, the, the religious issue about uh, uh, God is change versus uh, um, uh, more orthodox kind of conventional ideas about God, uh, which I think is an interesting discussion to go on with. But uh, you know, it doesn't have to be focused that way either uh, during the during the video. So, comments about the reading, about the writing that one is reading. <laughs> uh, I I would like to hear a little bit more about. Katina's not here, but but um, she raised some really interesting questions. So Marco was responding in a way that I thought was interesting about God. Yeah, I agree. God is process and God is action and God is becoming. And I think Marco was pointing out how um, we need God to be um, transcendent and, you know, active and, uh, and becoming and an agent of becoming. Um, it seems like there needs to be both in order for any kind of 
concept of God to really work. So I think this is one of the, one of the um, developments in this narrative so far is I think we're seeing a, a, the writing is extremely simple in the sense that it's almost a monosyllabic, you know, uh, I was walking down the street and I saw a guy who pulled out a gun, you know, it's all very, um, very concrete language. And yet I can, um, and we have a 16 year old girl who's um, dealing with this environment she's in and this culture, cultural milieu she's in. And she has um, obviously, uh, you know, highly developed cognitive skills um, that she's, um, you know, and she has an imagination. So I think this, and how she's, and she's trying to make a fit in this very uh, fragile and dangerous world that she's in which is in transition, as she is in transition as a teenager to adulthood, um, the environment she's in is even more volatile than her own uh, adolescence to uh, adulthood transition. So I think it's a very interesting, um, you know, so it's simple on one level, on another level you can start uh, sensing that it's getting more complex. And there's melodrama galore in this, which I enjoy, and it's not easy to write good melodrama, but I think she does. Because, you know, you see the adolescent boy and the, and the adult father who's, who's you know, this, this biblical kind of character, and you see them uh, fighting it out, and you see the mother coming in between. And these are all sort of stock characters um, we've seen many, many times. But, it's, but I found myself, as I was reading it, I was riveted on the edge of my seat and I felt a, like a punch in the gut, you know, when, as she describes the effects of these, this, these mel melodramatic, these kind of melodramatic strokes she's making. So it's, it's a, a good read. I, I also like Marco's comments on the forum. I, I was wondering how to react to I was sort of formulating some ideas about how to react to Katina's text when I saw Marco's post come up and I thought, wow, gee, I could, if, this is so much clearer than anything that I could formulate. So I was so pleased to see it. Um, I, did, I was thinking that um, one of the things about her idea about God is it's a very imminent idea of God. Um, it's sort of lost the whole transcendent uh, um, layer that normally ideas of God have, uh, you know, and the, the, this whole idea, I mean, God in her vision is sort of um, the, the, the environment in which one is engaged at all times and uh, including future and past and everything, but still, it's, it's experience as it is encountered rather than some external force or some extra element there. So it, it is, uh, and I also found, I mean, I, I sort of understand what Katina was saying about, uh, uh, it, it, it feels a bit odd to, when you start reading this. It, it feels very, Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, unconventional, but also it's not canon and you feel it's not canon and you and, and it seems a little bit too simple when you begin with it, but the more she gets into it and starts to spin it out, it becomes less simple. Uh, so... Well, I wish Katina was here to yeah. um, engage on this specifics because I think that there are maybe theological um, issues, you know, at, at play in how we conceive of the absolute, the divine. I mean, I, so I don't want to go too far into it, but one thing I, I do want to notice or do notice that I want to communicate is um, that she uses the word God, but I think that the word, the way that she, the character, uh, Lauren uses it, is more of a placeholder for a philosophical idea. 
than a a subject to whom you know one could with whom one could communicate with whom one could commune with whom one would have a, a relationship and i think that part of what katina is um arguing for and i, I don't know you know I, I think her i don't know exactly where her argument is coming from because i don't think we have, we've spoken enough but she's arguing for a god that you can you know that is a, per, a person that is a presence uh lauren's god is a lot more Nietzschean, uh, is a lot more um, just uh, like an intelligence, but not an intelligence that gives a shit <laughs> about um, human beings. Uh, and she says this much in, in some of her verses, God is power, God is chaos. Um, you know, God doesn't care about me or us. So we have to take matters into our own hands. And you know, whatever... Um, uh, rules or uh, um, you know designs about the way life should be one might have inherited or heard from some what uh, supernatural authority figure is irrelevant to the actuality of the situation in this situation I need to kill somebody because if I don't I'm going to go down in you know sympathetic pain and it's going to uh, you know dis destroy us um, Lauren is uh, in the thick of it, like she is, she's dealing with things on a day-to-day -day basis, and you get to follow the um, uh, the way that her theology uh, arises in response to her situation, uh, and I, and I think that that's part of what I mean it is is really interesting theologically because you could also have a a radical Christianity. Right, arise out of out of the same situation, and I think what Katina is doing is contrasting these two different ethics. Uh, be, that is to say, the the Christian ethic of uh, caritas, of of sympathy, uh, of uh, suffering with, and a um, uh, a kind of Nietzschean ethic, almost. Uh, although I think it goes beyond beyond Nietzsche. I mean, there's elements of Taoism in this. There are you know, various uh, aspects uh, to Lauren's, Lauren's um, ethos, but it, it really is, um, I think, grounded in the, um, the struggle for survival and then the struggle to dream something beyond the current situation. So I think it's a very interesting uh, conversation that, that, that we're having and um, I'm, I'm really, I was really glad that Katina, uh, you know, responded so um, passionately <laughs> to, to the theological question, because I think it's, it's really at the, the heart of this. And we were talking about prophecy and, you know, the different ways in which the text acts, you know, as a, uh, uh, not just a literary, but also a, you know, a, arguably a, a, a religious or prophetic kind of uh, text. It, it, I think it has a kind of indeterminate status uh, as to exactly what it is. If we take this seriously, take this, this um, earth seed idea uh, as a, a real you know, offering of a different way to conceive of, uh, of God and life. I didn't get a chance to speak up earlier when we were talking about talking, but I, when, when I talk about talking, I tend to embody that. So now I'm feeling, oh, I, I need to watch what I say, or I don't know what to say, but I, I have a lot to say about this. And I, I do like the direction that we're going. And yeah, the, the passionate side of this reflects Lauren, the, the characters, just passion for for change. I felt I, I didn't get a chance. I got a chance to finish the eight chapters, but I, I wanted to reflect on that this morning. But other work related issues arose. Um, but I feel like chapter five, when she's speaking with her father about kind of her philosophy or religious ideas, but not fully displaying it just yet. 
but her idea of survival of we can do more kind of ties into this theme of almost the stagnate it, it's it's almost the play off of the the idle hands or the the plaything of the devil but in her sense her father even though he's very active in her community even though they're coming up with ideas to protect the community they're still idle they're still stuck they're still waiting for something to change and i think that that juxtaposition of the idleness and the waiting versus or and saying the time is now we're not waiting on anything there i i don't know how this ties in with her religious beliefs we're not fully given that picture within the first eight chapters except through some some blurbs and some of her poetic writing that ends up being uh, whatever the earth or the earth scene book that she's compiling uh, in her journal um, so yeah in a way there, there's the physical response of fight or flight but in a way her father and crew and community are doing neither they're neither fighting though they're fighting for their lives nor are they fleeing um, they're they're just frightened they're they're using something different uh, and she wants to be the fighter um, and i i like that about lauren's character so it's very passionate and i think we can all learn something about that in tandem with what we're seeing in our world right now too Stuff well, she also says they're in denial, and you know she thinks that they should be prepared for what she sees coming. She she sees she knows that this situation that they're in, their relative security behind their walls in their you know middle class enclave, which is no longer middle class, uh, that that cannot last. So I think that like that that feeling that the people around you are in denial and you have to do something, you have to, you know, take action because nobody else is. I think that that really drives the, um, the narrative and the relationship too between the, 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 the different mindsets that, that people have. It, it is a very moral tale, isn't it? I mean, um, it, it, it's all about moral right action in a way it's about even though it's not canon it's still it's still about how does one make moral decisions and how and not just decisions but how does one act in a morally appropriate way so when she says they need to be better prepared for what's coming the reaction of the adults is to say well you know like her father is to say well you don't understand is it's more complex than that you can't just uh you know take people and get them prepared there are other issues going on and 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 we need to attend to those as well and you know it it's a it's not that he's unaware but he he's you know he's trying to calm people's fears he's trying to calm uh you know and 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 coax them into something i mean that's the sense one i i think gets about what he's trying to do um but and then she comes back and she insists and so ultimately the question is who who's right is is lauren right or is her father right and you know it, it, you know which is her father has the more cautious approach right uh the other thing i wanted to mention is something that came up in the reading of the of the uh, the biographer's book about her, about the way she wrote this book. So um, the book talks about Lauren, but apparently Octavia Butler in her notes about the book never talks about Lauren. She talks about Olamina, who, which is her last name. She thought of the character as Olamina, never as Lauren. But she decided when she wrote the book to give it 
this very human young girl and focus on the personal nature of Lauren as opposed to the sort of, because obviously Olaminia is more about the historical perspective and Lauren is more about the personal perspective. And part of why the character is so attaching is because we see things through her point of view with her insecurities and with her questionings. And, and, and so we're, we're in that vulnerable place. And, and that's partly why the book is, is so engaging, even in this early stage. So I just think it's an interesting contrast with, uh, with what it's one of those things where the writer has in her own note, she has these affirmations, but then what she ends up doing is different from what her notes suggest. Uh, it's one of the interesting things about this writer, I think. The political bit reminds me, um, the, the, between father and daughter, reminds me of the difference between in American politics, the liberal wing of the Democratic Party and the progressive or radical uh, wing, uh, because that kind of talk of, you know, we have to balance many different things and many considerations. We can't take decisive action because it's too complex. And that, that really is the message that you ultimately get from, you know, the, the more moderate liberal wing. Uh, whereas there's another side to, you know, that's in, in conventional discourse called further to the left, which uh, doesn't has lost patience, let's say, with 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 that um, that approach or that mentality, and that and I think it is a moral question because there one is not necessarily in a clear cut way right compared to the other. In this novel, one turns out to be right. Actually, I having read ahead, I I know a little bit more of what happens, but you one can see the father's point of view uh, because he is resonating with all the individuals with a history. And, you know, these older folks have been through this. They've been living through this now for decades. So they can see the um, rashness of, uh, of, of the younger person's perspective, but that doesn't mean that, that Olamina or Lauren is wrong. And so, I mean, that, that I, that's all I want to just notice there about, about this. Um, again, I think, this just feels so contemporary. Uh, and so I would, I would love to hear from others too. Donna, what about you? How are you greeting this novel? Hello, everyone. I'm really, uh, it's very interesting, the discussions I'm hearing. Um, maybe um, I read it from a different perspective, um, but what you've all said is very interesting for me. I didn't see these different, you know, perspective. The most important thing and the most important theme for me, I'm um, in the middle of chapter 13 now, is the theme of the wall. Maybe because she is an American writer and I'm living in an Arab region, regardless of the state I'm located in. So the most important thing for me psychologically as a being, been living in this region, psychologically, culturally, historically, religiously, the idea of the wall, the, the, the theme of the wall was always there in the background and me, I, and the other. And every now and then we're getting, you know, being invaded, invasions of the other coming in and coming out. But at the same time, I, I am as guilty as the other because I carry a pistol and then I do this and I do that. We're seeing the I only, but the other so far we didn't see. The only character I felt that was rebellious enough, and I've seen different characters living in this region, Keith, when he decided, no, I want to break this wall and I want to go out, no matter what, I will be killed, this will happen, that. But at least I want to say something against tradition, against 
culture, against my father's religion. And Lauren, in a way, she is thinking, like many people in my region, thinking, but maybe afraid to take the action, to question the God she has inherited from the Father, to question the place, how the place is, should we have a wall or shouldn't we have a wall? Should we live like this? Should I get married or not get married? She is questioning, but I have so far haven't seen an action from her part. And it's, I mean, I was reading the novel and thinking about me and people around me. Yes, we are questioning still, but we are questioning the change, change in everything. But are we ready? Can we do this change? I don't know what's going to happen in the rest of the novel, but yes, this idea of the wall, we are living in walls, walls that, regardless what the wall is, walls to question tradition, to question the culture we are in. Do we accept to change this culture? A wall is seen everywhere. A wall can be a hijab for a woman to just not trespass and get out of this wall. A wall can be the language itself. Maybe someone is not willing to communicate in a different language, in a different culture, in a different, and accept ideas and accept change. So this is how I read it so far. But I mean, I didn't, I don't know, but these are the themes that really this novel invoked in me. That was very interesting. You're, I remember uh, when the Berlin Wall came down, was that in 89, I think? And I, I remember I had a lot of German friends who really dramatized for me what it was like before then. Like I had mm -hmm. friends in the 70s and the 80s. And, um, and I remember these, my German friends would talk about visiting their friends in the East and the, the mm -hmm. different lifestyle they had than um, the West and this kind of uh, culture clash, you know? Mm -hmm. And of course, when the wall came down, everyone was liberated and we thought, you know, we'd reached the, the end of history, you know? Yes. And now, <laughs> how many, 30, 34 years later, we're starting to realize it ain't necessarily so, that this whole glo this globalization theme has backfired radically. And um, we're just seeing um, these escalating events happening all over the world with, um, you know, various, with the Brexit exit and with the, the refugees in Europe and, and with a, all these feuds around the, the Mexican border that Trump is trying to uh, escalate. Um, it, it's just really fascinating. Um, but there was something I remember, and I also was very touched by this struggle between Keith, her adolescent brother, younger brother, and um, I think this, uh, this surge in, in violence that often happens when um, adolescent boys are not reined in. Because um, that impulse is, can be liberating, but it also can lead to more and more violence. As I see with, I, I haven't read ahead, but I know Keith has returned with good clothes and with lots of money, which he gives to his mother. And it's obviously a sign that he's turning into a, a gangster. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think he's, he's broken through, but he's also sort of broken down in a way because his moral, the moral code that he's been raised to protect uh, is being, has been shattered. And I think that the wall is, a very, is very significant what you were saying, that wall, whether it's psychological or a physical wall um, that holds people in and prevents, keep, keeps other people out. Uh, yes. When those walls come down, there's all kinds of opportunities, but there's also an inevitable sort of um, ambiguity that happens. And the, the, the sort of traditional values of what's good and what's bad, which is very clearly maintained, are broken down. And we can mm -hmm. see uh, good kids maybe, like Heath, turning into warlords very quickly. Definitely. And like we saw in Sierra Leone, these young people were pumped full of drugs 
by nefarious forces that hyped them up and they would they were told to go cut off someone's hand which the way they would do you know so it was like a, they became pawns of uh, very nefarious forces so i think we're seeing all of these elements in this novel um are happening are continuing to happen in our world i just wanted to say one thing that, that struck me as i was reading this because in, in the natural world I think it's whales, when they're under attack, when there's an emergency, there's a, a traditional formation. The youngest males are on the outside, then comes the older males, and the women, and the children. Or women, I mean the females. <laughs> <laughs> See, I project my human experience onto the natural <laughs> very quickly. But the females are in the inner the female and the children are protected and they're in the center. Also, they're the, in many ways, probably the most precious aspect of this, uh, of this community. Um, so I think that, that the adolescent male is always on the front, is on, takes the blows, you know, and can defend most forcefully in an emergency. But when you're not in an emergency, that kind of setup is not a very good one. Um, so I think, um, uh, but I'm reminded of that as I, I read this, and I think the um, I think Octavia Butler is very familiar with with um, biology, and she's looking at Lemmergulus, and she's looking at the symbiotic uh, kind of systems. Um, so I think she's very aware of that kind of uh, ecology. Um, but I think her her idea that you can project that onto the onto other planets. I think it is a, it's part of her vision, I think. Um, but I think we're also, out, we're, we're also living under that kind of um, complexity that we're starting to wake up to, how complex the ecosystem is. The idea that we could move certain features of it to another planet and that it would flourish is extremely naive. <laughs> so I think the Elon Musk's of the world are really uh, trying to sell something um, that I think is, it, is, uh, is, is extremely premature to say the least and probably distracting us from taking care of things that we could take care of better and that we're ignoring because we have this colossal fantasy that we're just going to colonize the planet in a couple of, in a couple of thousand years. <laughs> anyway, those are my feelings. I don't know where this novel is going to go, but that's what's being activated. So thanks. <clears throat> Go ahead. Okay, well, I just wanted to share one thing, uh, not even a thought, but more of kind of a mosaic piece in the conversation. Uh, because uh, Donna, you meant talking about the wall and that being such an important theme in these, in these early chapters. Uh, and this, uh, what Katina mentioned, I think last week about intertextuality, it brought to mind another wall in another um, uh, science fiction, uh, novel, uh, which we read, uh, not all, all of us here in this group, but it was the first book we actually read in On the Infinite Conversations, and that's The, the Dispossessed by Ursula Le Guin. Uh, and I, I went and grabbed the book uh, just to share the first paragraph because I, it, it, uh, the theme is very similar. Uh, and it also involves two, in this novel, two different societies that are separated by a symbolic and a, and a literal wall. And uh, except they're on, also on different planets. So, um, but this book begins, there was a wall. It did not look important. It was built of uncut rocks, roughly mortared. An adult could look right over it and even a child could climb it. Where it crossed the roadway, instead of having a gate, it degenerated into mere geometry, a line, an idea of a boundary. But the idea was real, it was important. For seven generations, there had been nothing in the world more important than that wall. And I'll share one more line and then uh, uh, let, let Doug uh, chime in. Like all walls, it was ambiguous, two-faced. What was inside it and what was outside it depended upon which side of it you were on. And then she talks about the differences between the two worlds, but you said something about the other. And one thing, I, that that brought to mind is that we don't really get to know the other uh, so far in, in in this book, and I've read a bit further as well. But every all the action and all of the 
human subjectivity takes place amongst those who are inside of the wall. Uh, and those outside uh, are kind of like this nameless, just violent, you know, formless force that could come in in any number of ways and really, you know, doesn't, doesn't have uh, uh, character, doesn't have subjectivity that, that, that is apparent yet in the novel. So I thought that's just interesting to notice. that I have about five or six ideas roaming through my brain right now. Um, but going off of that, there was a television series maybe seven, eight years ago called Revolution. It was pretty horrible. I think it was by the creators who did Lost, which was pretty popular. But it, it talks about when the power goes out. Um, there's no, no power at all, no, no electricity or anything like that. It, it starts within uh, a small community and there's of course lots of violence lots of chaos that ensues and then in the second series you learn that there's really power going on and the higher the, the elon musks and maybe the, the technological folk are able to they have their own survival pack that they develop to survive but that, that idea came up uh, i wanted to share a personal walling which i'm personally undergoing yesterday and today Again, after I, I sent one faulty email that was unprofessional, I, I work as a contractor for the state. And that's led to all sorts of, um, like know your place, um, all sorts of everything. And it was just so I could help out a client, nothing major and in my, eye, my mind. But I, it was funny, I was told yesterday by my supervisor who, who's on my side, but she says to work with the state, you stay in your box. You you must <laughs> remain um, within the boundaries. You cannot go out of the boundaries, or you will be shot. <laughs> is essentially what she said, and it, it's true. Um, I'm not I'm not literally going to be physically attacked at any time soon. But I, I can only imagine what to live in that environment would be like. I, I love my job and. I'm not going to leave it based on what's going on here. Um, it's going to pass over, but to be in that situation, you, you would be willing to do what Keith did and go out and seek alternatives to seek other families, to seek, I've worked with uh, children who have been involved in gang life and um, they, they sense that they have no family or no one else to turn to. So they resort to this. And, I think you, Donna, and John both um, said that better than I'm going to here. I just wanted to add those thoughts. Well, um, without being absolute about it, which I, 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 I've become allergic to over my years, so. I do think you're right, Donna, that the wall is, it may not be the only symbol of importance in this book, but it's certainly the one that dominates the first half of the book, I think, in terms of, and, and of course, it's always interested in these issues because the wall is, I mean, as your reference to the Le Guin book points out, in the Le Guin book, the wall is a boundary. It's, it's a marker of a separation of two spaces. Um, in Butler's book, the wall is a fortified uh, uh, boundary. So it's not, not quite the same role. And I think, you know, in our modern culture, walls, I think you, you said that too, Donna, Walls are omnipresent in our current culture, not just because of Trump, but certainly he's done his part to increase the, the discourse around it. But I think it's much more pervasive than one person's influence. I think it's already in the culture and that Trump is just riffing off a, an element that's already in the culture. Um, and in a way, I mean, even though the book was written before all of this sort of emerged, 
what Butler is doing is engaging, taking the bull by the horns, engaging with the concept of wall, which, I mean, I, I don't know about you folks, but I mean, I'm a very thoughtful guy and I think about politics and I worry about things. But the fact the walls have become so omnipresent is not something that I particularly want to spend very much time thinking about. You know, I, I, it's sort of almost a, it's not a taboo subject exactly, but it's a, it's a subject that is not easy to approach. And Butler does it directly. I mean, she, she, she builds the whole first part of the book around the whole idea of the wall. And although you can read it in a kind of like the way I read it, I sort of felt, oh yeah, well, this is the wall that we all worry about that we're constructing, right? This is the, the one that, um, it, it's almost a caricature of a wall in a way. Um, of the wall that we're worried about, that we're creating, the walls that we're worried that, that we're creating. And yet it's not a caricature because the more you explore the way that people interact with the wall and the way that they deal with the outside versus the inside, um, there's an organic element to these interactions, which is not caricature. And so, there's an exploration of the role of, so even the, the discussion around the young boy, Keith, and his wanting to be outside versus inside and all of those issues. I, I, I think it's, um, I think it's, I think that's part of why the book matters. I think because the book is allowing us to explore stuff that we are having trouble exploring in other contexts. And the book is providing us an opportunity to explore these things uh, in ways that are troubling, but deepening in terms of understanding. I, I don't know whether it's going to change anything. We'll see. But uh, um, I do think it's, so I, I think this whole idea of the wall is, is um, huge, not just for the book, for, but for us as well. Jeffrey, I think you're you're totally right that in Le Guin's book, the wall is metaphor is more metaphorical. I mean, it like she says, a child could look over it. It has a psychological significance. In Butler, it's realistic, uh, and I think that if you if you look at um, societies where there's a breakdown in, in civil order, and I can. Um, uh, I've seen this per personally in, in, my, in my family in El Salvador, because after the war there, and in the aftermath of the war, all the middle class communities, uh, the houses, uh, you saw barbed wire going up around them. You saw if they didn't have barbed wire, they used uh, broken beer bottles and things like that. And then, and then many communities, and these are middle class communities. These are you know, not the wealthy. Um, although, you know, the, the, the distribution of wealth is different there compared to here. We're becoming more like, like that. Um, but they will form their own little enclaves, hire their own security, and put barbed wire up all around, all around them. And life goes on. The, the, you know, you, they go to the mall and, you know, people go to work and people are out and about. But there is this physical way that when people begin to feel threatened by uh the social breakdown uh we just start putting up literal walls and it it, it becomes a, ma a kind of self-reinforcing um uh situation because the fear creates more fear which makes it harder to solve the problems that are you know underlying the crisis uh and in, i think the middle east is also a very good example of you know where you would see this this kind of thing uh, and I would see it, you know, like I said last week, to me, it's very plausible uh, for how things could go in this country if there are some wrong turns or some, you know, bigger mishaps. And it's really interesting that the United States here, like California, becomes the new South. 
uh, it becomes the new you know central and uh, and um, and South America where you, know, you have people trying to migrate upwards towards relative safety and security as Canada you know w w represents in, in this novel um, so yeah I, I think I think it's it's something that uh, you know, she, I think Butler is saying that we're in denial. We're, we're in very big denial. Um, I am, um, but I think the wall, the nature of the wall is uh, starting to change dramatically as sea levels start to rise because there ain't no wall big enough to keep out the Atlantic Ocean uh, during one of these uh, gigantic hurricanes. And uh, I live in, I was in Manhattan, the first hurricane I ever, happened in Manhattan was Sandy, which I could think was five or six years ago. But we were all told it was very unusual that this size storm was coming towards us, but that we were all safe. And um, I was taking, I was responsible for an elderly gentleman um, with, with mild dementia, um, but he was had Parkinson's. And um, we were on the 30th floor, very, you know, very well to do neighborhood. And uh, the radio said we were in an area that was totally safe. Even in the worst circumstances, we were totally safe. But even though I've, I've been raised in a hurricane, I was raised in Houston, so we, I've been through many hurricanes before. So even though I was told that we were totally safe, I filled up the tub full of water. And it's a good thing I did, because an hour after we were told on the radio that we were, actually it was the TV, that we were totally safe, there was a blackout. All the electricity gone, internet gone, um, everything was gone, except the trees outside, which are growing like this. <laughs> and everything was blacked out. Um, I didn't know what had happened. And it was, and that was the, and no one was able to relieve me for three days. Three days I was in this, on the 30th floor. There was a hospital across the street. Um, but normally if there was an emergency, I could wheel him out in his wheelchair to the elevator, go down 30 flights and wheel him across the street. And there we were at Bellevue. But this blackout meant that there was no medical services that he could have access to, even though we were living across the street from a hospital. And as I recall, I think the generator didn't work. So that the hospital had been blacked out. So it was really primitive conditions um, of the scariest kind. And because I couldn't sleep, because what if I fell asleep and this old man gets up and falls down and breaks his hip? I, he would die because there'd be no way we, I could get any emergency to him. I couldn't call anyone. <laughs> I couldn't log on and, you know, send a text. So after the third day and we got some relief and I got home, um, it was really, and the night starts to come. Because I was, everything below 40, 42nd Street, I found out, was blacked out. And we were in that condition, I think, for five days. So I had two days of like, and I would go up to 42nd Street up to, um, you know, to recharge the batteries on my computer. So I would go back down into the dark at night and I would have a recharged computer so I could, but I didn't have any internet service. So it didn't matter <laughs> whether, my, whether I was charged up or not. So it was those kinds of really weird kind of experiences. So here I was in lower Manhattan, blackout, total silence, which is very eerie. And what I did here were the mice running between the walls. And that was it, <laughs> no stimulation at all. And after, and I was getting ready to go bonkers. So I'm just saying these kinds of the threats that we're under now, and I have my brother who lives in Houston during that last hurricane. He said they've, they've pretty much cleaned up and gone back to normal, except the front glass, the window of his house, there's a business there. And he said, some group came in with a car and they drove through the glass and they got in and they got all the thousands of dollars worth of computers and drove off. And so now he says, there's this feeling of, of terror among homeowners, just sort of like you described in the middle-class uh, areas of San Salvador. Uh, where, you know, he had to get a gun, and which he'd never done before. He got a rifle, learned how to use it, and he had to get an intense security system. And he said they came back, but because it triggered the alarm and all the lights came on, and, um, you know, he had a gun, which he raised, 
they all ran, they ran off. But I'm just saying these are the kinds of things that it's very going to be very hard, I think, to build walls that are going to be of any use whatsoever. Um, because, you know, the enemy isn't outside there on the other side of that wall anymore. Um, anyway, I'm just sharing this because I think this is the kind of forces that are forming this young person's mind, you know, in this environment. She's in the middle of these con conditions, which happen very rarely to most of us. Maybe in emergencies, we're, we're confronted with these kinds of, these kind of difficulties. But it seems like her whole uh, childhood and her, her young adulthood are are coming out of these kind of circumstances and she has enough imagination to sort of think about long term and short term and i think she also is an empath i'm reading i this book is called mirror touch it's by a physician who has the condition that uh lauren has it's called mirror mirror touch synesthesia and it's a capacity to feel other people's pain in your own body and that, I think, is, uh, I don't think Butler knew about this condition. Maybe she had a little bit of it herself. I think, to some extent, all artists and sensitive people do. But now we know it's a medical condition. Uh, very few people in the, have this kind of condition. And why, if you were a physician, you would, with this condition, you would choose that profession? I have no idea. But this guy, every time he gives someone an injection, he feels it in his own body. So I think these kind of things make this character, Lauren, a very compelling uh, sort of potential leadership qualities because she is so empathic, which as you mentioned, alpha males who, you, or, or alpha females often are extremely empathic, um, which is not often reported in, in, the, in our sort of popular press. So I think that, and she has short-term, long-term focus. I think, and she's active rather than passive, makes her sort of a candidate for a, a, a new kind of leader in her. I haven't read ahead, but I'm just sort of, these are my intuitions. I think this is what Butler's sort of setting up for us. Yeah, and in the first eight chapters, she doesn't mention but once, uh, both Lauren and uh, Butler in her writing doesn't mention, uh, but once her hyper and that empathic condition so it'll definitely play a role I imagine but I wanted to go back to just the environmental aspect and kind of tying that in with everything else too and I, I was reflecting on what you were saying during the disaster during the blackout but there are so many countries around the world that aren't hampered like we Americans or certain countries that they'll have brownouts or blackouts two or three times a day. It's no biggie. There's not going to be any violence that comes up, but I, I feel like here in America, we are well underprepared for something like that, even though we have disaster aid and things like that. But psychologically, we as a whole would, would resort to chaotic, chaotic situations quicker than um, other residents of other countries would. And I think that's something I see reflected in um, Lauren, and she realizes that something's coming, something's coming, and a lot of it, uh, the undertones in the book, there's, there's quite a bit of environmental undertones, um, which aren't directly mentioned. I mean, there might be uh, a talk about, well, there's six years, no, no rain, that's a pretty big one there, um, but it's, it's going, to, yeah, I, I feel like us pampered folk, <laughs> not that I'm a pampered person, but in general, our society is very pampered and we are not doing a thing to prepare for. There's, there's forest fires everywhere going on in California. There's, there's yeah, sea levels rising. Yeah, we could talk about that forever. And, and we're not even, we're not protecting the electrical grid. So what happened in lower Manhattan could happen across the country. And we would be totally, in three days, there would be no food. The supermarkets would be empty. So it's not that far-fetched. Uh, and we're not doing anything about, not just the environment, but the electrical grid, which is everything is dependent upon. If we're not forking out the money to protect that very essential technology, I think it's ludicrous to think that we could uh, pack it all up and 
and, and go to Mars. <laughs> I'm curious what, what you all would think about um, the guns in this book. I mean, this is a, a big debate in the United States, for sure, at, at this time. Um, and you know, Lauren's very pro-gun. Uh, and the whole community has really taken up to arms. Uh, but I think it would it, it uh, challenges maybe some of the uh, positions that uh, people who otherwise would agree with or identify uh, with with our, with Butler would otherwise hold. Um, I'd like to respond to that just with the recent election. I I have a shotgun I received at when I turned sixteen, and I received it from a great grandfather. He's he's my who I'm named after and I have no relationship to guns and I was baffled by this gift and it's never been used, never been, I, I moved it around with me just because it's a, it's a, something he prized to give me. So I'm not going to sell it, I have it, I don't have any ammo for it. But during the 2016 election, um, I'm not very political and I wasn't having any discussions, nor am I, watching news or anything to spark this, this feeling in me. But I just picked up this sense that um, we say here, shit's going to hit the fan. And I live in a conservative neighborhood, conservative state, and most people own guns. There's my neighbor who I've mentioned carries holsters one as he's walking around with his kids running around. And I questioned that. Um, and I, I seriously thought I would have to some time down the line, um, protect my family just based on conversations I've had with others with what I perceived could turn into, um, just some sort of chaotic result after the election. This, this feeling died down maybe after a week or or two, um, but it really opened my eyes up to what I believe. And like we were mentioning, just, just John was mentioning, just simply having a shotgun <laughs> or a gun uh, to wave off the, the looters or somebody else. Um, I, I wouldn't uh, have any second thoughts about that when the time came. Um, but as, as a whole in the debate against guns, I, I don't have any opinion. So this is an important issue for me because uh, I, I, I think I mentioned maybe not fully, but uh, my last um, last time I was in the United States was about um, two and a half, three years ago. I went there for a, a workshop on sewing uh, costumes, uh, like uh, 18th century costumes. And it was at Gettysburg. Um, because uh, it's a group that does reenactment of the battles at Gettysburg. And so they're engaged with, um, um, you know, making costumes for that. And so they have a long history of it, the woman who organizes it. And, and so it was a group of experts for me to learn something about making these, these costumes. So I went, it's a week long workshop. Um, but um, because they were reenactors, something I didn't realize ahead of time, it meant that conversation during lunch hour or any breaks was all about guns, how to make ammo, how to make how, all the different shooting practices, all the different kinds of guns. I mean, I got so sick and, and, and it was, wasn't just about guns, but there was a, a, a young black woman from Baltimore who, We lost you, Jeffrey. Can you hear him? I can't, can't hear you him. You got frozen. Interesting, that never happens. I have another comment, I guess I'm talkative today, but um, while we're waiting on Jeffrey to come back, I, I mentioned my wife's Filipino and I will go to these Filipino parties and almost all the, the males are not my age. And 
anyways, the, the conversation turns to guns with, with these 50, 60 year old males. And uh, we, we didn't catch too much, Jeffrey, if you can hear us. So at, um, I was just after. saying there was, there was a woman there who was uh, from Baltimore and her husband was with the police force there. And there were other people in the room who were very conservative, gun toting, redneck kind of Republicans. And they constantly hounded this woman about a kind of, uh, it was racism essentially in, in a particular form and, uh, and sort of uh, hounded her about her lifestyle and her police husband and all sorts of negative comments about everything that was around her life. It was really, really uh, difficult to listen to. Uh, at one point, I came into uh, the events of the day, and this sort of woman who was, I think she was, she said she was from Texas, but I mean, I'm not saying all Texans are like that, but uh, uh, so she came in and said, oh, I saw a rabbit outside, and I really wish I had a shotgun with me, because I would have blown it to smithereens, and I thought, a rabbit, and this is what you were going to talk about when you come so I haven't been back to the States for three years because I don't want to have, you know, I, I feel like I, I got better things with my life than to put myself into this kind of conversation dialogue with people. So I'm coming in, 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 in uh, to Colorado in, in October, but it's my first foray into the States in three years um, as a result of this uh, sort of um, Mania, and I, you know, I, I've been to the states lots of times. Lots of I've done lots of conferences and things over the years. So it, it's not, it's just a kind of saturation with it. And and uh, in Canada, of course, there's a, you know, a lot of discussion about the issue, um, not as much as in the states, and not quite so controversial. Although it is controversial here. Um, so uh, the we had a conservative government in the federal level and the conservative, there was a gun registry and the conservative gov government dismantled the gun registry. And Quebec as a province had its own gun registry and it wanted to keep its gun re registry even though the federal government was disbanding it. And the federal government, so they simply wanted the federal government to hand over to some of the data and the federal government refused to do it. So the, even the provincial gun registry was dismantled as a result. So, um, and, and, you know, these semi-automatic weapons and so forth are available in Canada, even though you're not allowed to, to buy them, but people can get them. So you do get incidences up here as well. So, um, but I, I find, so I, I mean, I'm much closer to Le Guin's uh, reading of violence than I am to Butler's reading of violence, you know, so uh, much more comfortable with a more nonviolent. I mean, I was engaged in nonviolent um, protests in my youth, and 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 that's still part of my ethos. And uh, um, I, I don't think it's necessarily easy. I, I, I'm not saying that um, taking a principled stance against weapons is necessarily easy. I think it can put you. You, you can put yourself in very dangerous situations in doing that. I don't think the situations are any less, any more dangerous than if you have a weapon. I don't see that the weapons help. I mean, they may confer a measure of security to a person. That's what they seem to do. I'm not, the evidence doesn't seem to indicate that they actually confer any real advantage. So um, my reading of it anyway. So. I just have to report something very odd that just happened. Um, uh, last night I had a dream and it was a very significant experience that happened in the dream. Uh, and, I, and I woke up and I was reflecting upon the dream. I, was I wasn't asleep, but I was in that sort of halfway. And I was thinking about the dream. And as I was thinking about the dream and in this very relaxed state, I heard a voice and the voice said, Gettysburg. <laughs> and I went, Gettysburg, huh? What the hell does Gettysburg have to do with this last dream I had? Well, maybe the character in that dream had, he and I had a past life in Gettysburg or something. And I went off into a fantasy around Gettysburg and being a soldier. And I was, 
I got bayoneted or he bayoneted me or whatever. But then when I heard you say that, Gettysburg, I immediately flashed on having written this down two hours ago. Um, I, I felt like not synchronicity, but a little bit of that time, the fluidity of time when we get into certain states. And I think these kind of, uh, these uh, happenings sometimes happen, and I think they're happening to Lauren in this novel. Uh, she anticipates the future quite a bit and potential dangers that she gets extremely prepared for. So I think when you're in these kinds of danger zones, you get a little, I mean, what I just shared with you, registering Gettysburg in a, in a semi-dream state and you saying the word, Gettysburg and me remembering that I had written this down. I think those kinds of things are, happen a lot to us, but we just don't pay attention to them. But if we do pay attention to them, they become extremely odd. Because <laughs> I just, and I had another one about, I had a dream about a scorpion and I was handling this scorpion and it was like, gee, I, it doesn't hurt. I would think this scorpion, if it bit me, would really hurt bad. And then I read like the following day, a passage from Aurobindo where he got bit by a scorpion. And he felt no pain. Actually, uh, the traditional pain that most people associate with getting bit by a scorpion did not happen. It registered as total bliss to him. So I thought, well, this is a great capacity to have. <laughs> you know? But anyway, I think these novels and these, these stories and what's happening to us is, as I read it, I feel this intensity, this intensification. And I'm reading Deleuze right now, and he uses that word all the time. I think the, we read these things and we go to movies because our bodies crave intensity and if we don't give it intensity in healthy ways it gives us intensity in ways that we probably wish we didn't have to endure so i think this is a, is a challenge for us is how do we how do we deal with all this intensity in a way that can become creative rather than incredibly destructive or you know create these real negative and paranoid fantasies that we then act out in the world. So, thanks. I'm wondering too, if we talked about the wall and it's physicality, it's tangible. Is, is that equatable to a body or the body in a sense? Like um, if we feel more pressured or if we sense things around us are, or, or the environment's about to collapse, are we, does, is that when the metaphorical wall becomes the, the physical wall? Because our, our personal walled body is being affected. Just a thought. Well, um, if we go back to the idea of the gun, for me, I come from a region where weapon plays a role and this weapon culture um, is used to exercise in a way power and we can see it in I mean I myself saw it in the novel those who carry a gun they have power and thus the clash between Keith and the father it's a clash basically for power did the gun really brought them peace did they in a way stopped the thieves and did using the gun, how can I guarantee that I'm not opening fire to innocent people? How can I guarantee this as a community closed on myself and at the same time letting children carry guns? This for me was, you know, they have this certain age where yes, you can carry a gun. What are we giving this generation? What are we telling them? Yes, take a gun. This is the only way for you to survive. Is this us as a humanity? The weapon, did we need it in, 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 in cultures before? When did we start as a industrial communities? When did we start to think, yes, I need this culture, this gun culture. I needed it, I need to build a border and I need to have a gun. This is the only way to survive. This is the only way for peace and there is not, nothing else. Keith, for me, was the most human character where he decided, well, I have to cross the world and I am free to 
decide what I want to do, how I want to do, and how I want to go out of this community and really to see a different way of living. So this community closed and building a wall, a border, and the gun itself is playing a big role in this community at the level of the family and at the level of the uh, community itself. So this is how I saw the gun in a way. And later on, um, the second part of the book, which in which there is no tangible wall in the same way, the gun still is there and the gun still serves that role. It creates a kind of a virtual wall where, you know, so that the weapons create a kind of virtual wall. So, yeah, I agree that it's... Uh... This one bit, bit more on the wall. The other bit of intertextuality is that uh, Sloterdijk writes quite a bit about the wall uh, in, in, in Spears, particularly in volume two of Globes. And so this is part of his idea that you know, each cultural unit forms, forms spheres and the wall is a concrete, literally concrete instantiation of it that sets the perimeter, that sets the, the, the boundary, but it's so ancient. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's, it's so, uh, it's such a defining part, you could say, of the human way of being that in a violent world, uh, we get the idea to wall ourselves off. And uh, so, uh, you, know, you know, that, you know, th then you can have many different kinds of walls, mm. and psychological walls and language walls and, and so forth. Uh, but we also want to go beyond our walls. And I think that's what Keith uh, does. I don't think he was such a smart character in, in this. <laughs> uh, I, I've read a bit. I mean, we know what happened. I don't know. If you know what, mm. I don't want to spoil it, but what happened? <laughs> not very nice. Um, and but that that I think speaks to your point that mm. doesn't solve the doesn't solve the issue, uh, and the gun culture doesn't solve the issue. Uh, and so I, I, at the same time, I I can um, I can understand. Uh, when one is directly threatened, you know, like us talking here hmm. is not the same as really being directly threatened and wanting to protect something that you that you love, hmm. uh, your family or, um, whatever, or, or whatever it is. But going back to the idea of the wall being an ancient idea and that we've been always building a wall, that's correct. I mean, historically speaking, but... It's different now, the walls we have. For example, let's take, I mean, I, sorry, I have to go back to my region. Let's say that during the um, Crusaders, in a way, yes, people might build walls, castles, cities. But let's say I am living during that time and there were walls. But I was free enough to cross borders. Imagine now me as a refugee trying to cross the wall. It's totally different. Me as a human being, I had the right to cross between borders and walls. But now I'm living in a different world where the wall now is not only built, but it's prohibiting my freedom to cross. That's the other side of the wall. That's, that's being on the outside. Yeah. But I think that dynamic, the us, um, the subject, the object divide is shifts when you're an empath, as Lauren is, or as this Dr. Dr. Salinas with this uh, mirror touch synesthesia, because they don't have the same, there's no wall. If another person is in pain, it's my pain. And that, I think, would prevent a person from, you really making me mad, I think I'll just punch you out. Because <laughs> you'd be basically doing this. Anytime you hit someone else, you're hitting yourself. But I think this is this empathic experience, which in some people may be extremely extreme, 
Um, but in some ways, this is foundational for our whole culture. Our, our culture's ability to survive is that there have been enough people who've had these experiences who've turned it into the golden rule. Uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. This is like the basic foundation um, for any kind of moral morality, although there may be enormous variations from culture to culture. Um, but I think when you're, when you're up against it and these very uh, primal kind of emotions dominate, um, I think these, uh, the, those who are in more, have a more empathic and a, and a different sensibility about subject object, it's not so, there is no wall. I think it becomes, you know, a source of great drama for, for Butler because I, I have a feeling that she is one of these really odd empathic types um, who uh, is trying to, to write about how ambiguous the world becomes when there's no clear good guy, bad guy kind of dynamic. In book three, uh, Foam's Slaughter Dyke, we, we haven't read yet, but he does take, well, take it from, um, but going back to Globes, I really, not that I want to discuss Slaughter Dyke here, but it, it mentions one of my favorite parts was the archaic fire that supposedly groups were around. And then as, as there were more and more in the tribe, the outer, the outer rings would not receive the heat and that would be those that conspire those that were in the cold and would um, basically be conniving or find ways to get to the middle um, that's sort of the outside mentality and, and um, this book we're reading now but yeah, and, and foam see I, I read ahead and maybe you could join us if you're able to Donna <laughs> it's, uh, but I don't know when we'll get around to reading that but it does get into more of the, the personal level and, and the communal. Um, but I, I know Katina still isn't here. I was hoping she would come. Um, she, she questioned in the forum, this impact, that where, where is the empathy? And I don't know if she's talking about the text as a whole or the series as a whole. Um, so I, I'd like to focus on that in the future at least for myself when reading. Because um, as we mentioned, she, John um, mentions this hyper empathic quality to her, but she doesn't really demonstrate that at all other than kind of seeing the bigger picture and maybe thinking, well, this would be better for people. But directly as an adolescent female, she is not empathic, empathetic at all. Um, or, or it's maybe tough love is uh, what you can view it. I, so. I think there's a moment though when her father is beating up her brother Keith after he escaped and came back and got robbed and put the, the community in jeopardy. Uh, I think there's a, she gets physically ill and has mm -hmm. to, and she walks outside and walks down the steps and is dizzy. I think that's an indication that she's having a very strong empathic response. Um, so I think that she, she sort of describes her empathic capacities and then she doesn't refer to them much at all. But I think there's, uh, I think the reader can be alerted to this um, capacity that she has. And um, of course she may be in an environment where she can't, she doesn't talk to anybody about her interior world. Or if she does, it's sort of high risks because she's around very conventional oriented people. And, um, so I, I, I think this could be something that she develops further because I think it's probably why she takes on these, uh, you know, these, these, uh, this role in her community, this leadership mm -hmm. role um, that's sort of, uh, I, I think she's sort of a, a gender fluid kind of person as I think Octavia Butler was. Uh, so she's, she doesn't quite fit in any kind of normative grid um, anyway, I, I, I haven't read that far ahead, so I don't know what's going to happen next, but I think yeah, some of this seems is like probably. Butler is planting the seeds for, for this. And she does that with quite a few other things. So it goes with her, her earth seed and star seed metaphor. Yes. There. So exactly. I like that. Yeah. 
Um, I think uh, Katina was referring to what I understood from what she was saying was that uh, the society in general seems to be less empathic. You know, so yeah, there's, she has this particular empathic condition, but that the, in general, there's a kind of a decline in empathy. And so that's also, I think maybe she's right. I think that that is maybe present in the novel, that there is a, a sense of, of a change in that sense around empathy in the way that, you know, which is troubling for our society too, because in fact, you know, and that was part of what Katina was writing about, that, uh, that there may be this change going on and this move away from a kind of an empathic response. Um, anyway, it's a, I thought it was an interesting discussion. The other thing that um, I was thinking about when I was reading this, I'm not sure, I don't think it was in the first act chapters, but it might've been the next few. Um, she talks about this idea because she has this empathic uh, and she feels it in her body, this empathic response, that she has to um, be more violent towards people. That is to say, she has to um, either kill them or reduce them to unconscious very quickly, because otherwise she becomes too heavily affected. So it becomes a kind of a, a way to manage this. And... That reminds me of um, Urs uh, Orson Scott Card and his book Ender's Game, which had a similar empathetic, empathic character, main character, who also had to do the same thing in order to, he wasn't quite the same condition. He didn't have this physical engagement with empathy, but he had a very empathic uh, uh, relationship with people and he had to do something very similar. And um, Card wrote, after Butler. So um, I, th I think I, I did check the dates, but I'm pretty sure that he wrote his story after Butler. So anyway, there's a kind of a relationship in a way between those two writers. Although, you know, as I say, Card has fallen out of favor these days, but uh, um, for other reasons. Well, I think we all feel that to some extent. Um, we're becoming more empathic as, you know, our media and um, Facebook and dealing with um, social media and the effects of it and, you know, Jordan Brown's film on the effects of flat screens on our cognition and uh, on our blunting our affective capacities. So I think we're in, those of us who are more empathic than others are actually, it can be a hell, it can be total hell because you're taking on other people's stuff and it's being amplified in your system, perhaps more so than in those who are, you know, cut off. And I think that uh, is, a, is a, a challenge for a lot of us. So, um, because I think if you are in these empathic zones, there's a, non, a lot of ambiguity about self and other that is not an issue for people who are easily able to separate. But, Yes, that doesn't mean you're free of violence or the threat of violence or you can't commit violence because you have that capacity to, you know what the other guy is thinking and what's on their mind. And if it's uh, hostile towards you, then there has to be enough desire to protect yourself and your loved ones to mobilize a response. But as, as Donna said, I don't think guns is going to create peace. Maybe temporarily, short term solution, um, but I think long term, I don't think there's any hope for bigger and better guns promoting peace. So, um, you know, I think we're all sort of up against it. And how do we use our imaginations in order to em empower us and to look at alternative ways of knowing so that some sort of peace could emerge out of our interactions rather than this sort of reptile brain co-opting our technology and promoting these uh, fight flight freeze responses in our nervous systems. It's very complex. So um, I belong to a research group that's in the process of being of forming. It's been, uh, it's been uh, developing over the last year. So it's a research group um, around the issue of vulnerability. 
um, which is an interesting topic because um, related concepts such as resilience have been well studied, but the issue of vulnerability itself has not been well studied. And so uh, the, the, it's an interesting problem. And the part of the difficulty that we're having as a group, I mean, I think we're all very aware of it. It's, it's a very eclectic group, social scientists, some hard scientists, computer scientists, some uh, artists as well. So it's a, a mixed group. Um, and it also has a very personal as well as a scholarly approach. So there's, I mean, we're all aware that if you're dealing with issues of vulnerability, your personal your personal engagement is on the line. It's not, can't just be a scholarly engagement. It has to include the personal. So, um, but one of the interesting about vulnerability and it's related to this issue of empathy is that uh, vulnerability has two components. One is your, your um, in danger of being uh, damaged or hurt, right? So that's one sense of vulnerability. But the other sense of vulnerability is that in order to grow, you have to be aware of your own vulnerability. And so, um, and, and so, and we live in a society in which being aware of your vulnerability and acknowledge it is in increasingly more difficult to do because, because we live in a society that doesn't want to look at vulnerability. And so if you acknowledge, like for instance, in a work environment, if you acknowledge that you feel vulnerable, you're likely to be a little bit like Doug's uh, whole situation with his job, marginalized, pushed off to the side uh, uh, and treated as persona non grata. Uh, and that's the status quo for most of our modern work environments. And so it's very difficult to address um, and even in learning environments, it's difficult for people to acknowledge their own vulnerability. And yet you can't grow if you don't acknowledge your vulnerability. And so it's got this double component to it. So, and one of the other issues that the group is dealing with is, so the notion of empathy is certainly present, but it's also this notion of sympathy. And sympathy is an older idea than empathy. Empathy is gained a lot of currency because it's related to mirror neurons and all of the work that was done in, co in modern cognition. But sympathy is an idea that dates back to the French Enlightenment and earlier. And it has a much broader uh, and more literary kind of uh, engagement and, uh, and a somewhat different focus in terms of what it means is not just about identifying with the other, but also um, just being sensitive to the other without necessarily fully identifying with them. So, um, so it, it's, I just want to bring these items forward because I think they are in the context of the book that we're discussing and may enrich the discussion around some of these issues. So. One observation uh, regarding Lauren is that she feels the pain of others physically. So they get stabbed, she feels it, that kind of a thing. It, I haven't seen so much that she's empathetic in an emotional sense. Uh, does she feel the feelings of the emotional feelings of others, the sadness, depression, anger, whatever it is? There's a story by Le Guin called Vaster Than Empires and More Slow, which uh, has a, a crew of uh, experience uh, you know, space explorers going to another planet and one of the characters is an emotional empath so they can't stand to be around any of the other people and, and this character Odin or Ogden is his name is uh, very prickly because he feels everybody else's uh, uh, moods and all the muck of their of their inner lives and I haven't sen sensed that so much in uh, in Lauren uh, so I'm just noticing that and something I'd like to see develop further. It's not that she doesn't care or love because she loves her father, she loves her family, she loves her community, etc. But I'm not seeing that the hyper empathy is playing out on that on that level. Uh, just the other um, thing I would introduce is we have empathy, we have sympathy, and we also have compassion. 
and there are three different flavors of I think a similar capacity to um, feel what the other feels uh, and to um, put oneself in their in their skin or if you will uh, but but they're different and I, I'm I'm glad you uh, brought up the difference between sympathy, sympathy and empathy because I think it's very interesting, uh, Jeffrey. And I think later on the word compassion also comes in through uh, one of the other characters who begins to question uh, Lauren's uh, actions and her ethic and offer you know his own uh, different take on it. That, that's a character named Harry. There is some some discussion of her um, emotional empathy. Um, it's it's downplayed. You're right. The physical empathy is what is sort of the main thing. At one point, she talks about like uh, she and the boy make love, and she talks about that there is a pleasure empathy that she picks up from the connection with him. So, and she does talk about the fact that there's empathy is not just about pain, but also about pleasure. So there is a little bit of discussion on it, but it's not front and center. Um, in another novel of hers that I read, um, Mind of My Mind, it's really about um, highly uh, psychic, not just empathic, but psychic. Um, and, uh, and there's vampirism. And this, this psychic vampire basically manipulates other people's organisms and can take them over. He, he's trying to create a race of super psychic vampires <laughs> and he's uh, impregnated a lot of human women um, to carry these uh, capacities into the next generation. And then if it doesn't work out, because it doesn't work out, highly, these highly psychic children when they grow up can't stand each other and they can't have relationships because it's incredibly painful to be reading everybody's thoughts and feelings around you. So, um, so he's trying to breed um, humans who can handle that. And, um, and, and, and since it doesn't work out, he kills his own children. You know, if he sees them antag two antagonists who are burn out too quickly, or they blow a fuse, which often they do, he just kills them. Um, so it's a fascinating read especially if you have any psychic abilities <laughs> because you start to realize what a burden they can be and no doubt people who are highly psychic have a, a really hard time managing their gifts and uh, especially if you're expected to exploit them for material gain or to figure out what wall street's going to happen you know i think those those kind of crude uses of our psychic abilities is, is pretty sad um but I also think, um, you know, if you if you have psychic abilities and you and you can't function in you know late stage capitalist kind of uh, comp highly competitive environments, you're going to really be in trouble. So I guess you know, to the extent you have these capacities, empathic or psychic capacities, you're going to have to learn how to deal, um, because we don't live in a culture that prizes them a great deal. And uh, we're, all, we're told if we have those feelings, we're just too vulnerable and need to get with a program or, or become, a, you know, become a man, you know. Um, so anyway, that, that's an interesting development, I think, that she's working with. And I don't know how Lauren, is, if she's going to become more psychic, but she definitely is becoming a, a leader, as did the, 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 the character in Mind of My Mind. It's, 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 a, it's a woman character who becomes a leading psychic is able to have enormous power. It's, it's kind of scary. Look at Trump. <laughs> I think he emerges out of this, this kind of, uh, a, a lot of people who uh, got him elected uh, were into um, the, the occult. And many of us are making these maybe grandiose claims that they have maneuvered him into this position of power because of their occult practices. Um, and I think there's been a book written on this. Uh, Gary Lockman wrote a whole book on it. So I think it's in our, I think it's in, our atmos in the atmospheres that we're all uh, working with. And I think she was really ahead of the curve in this book. She's really, I think, um, what, what she was writing about in the 90s has even become 
more of a more of a, more of a trend, I think, in, in the times we're living in. Writing on the scene. I'm probably going to finish this book. <laughs> uh, I, I couldn't stop myself from reading it. Actually, uh, I, I was reading it compulsively because I just wanted to see what happened. Uh, so I've, I've been holding back a little bit just because I don't want to, uh, you know, spoil things. And not, I haven't quite gotten to the end, but I, I probably will by next week. Just well, saying. I I read the last half of the book in one sitting because it got I got stuck. <laughs> I think till two in the morning or something, you know. So. <laughs> but I've held off reading book two until the rest of us are further further along before packing that. Well, do you want to speed up the reading of the book? Because I could read much faster, but I stopped myself because I wanted to stay within the parameters of what was set up. But um, if it's moving smoothly and quickly, maybe we could uh, read it faster. Than originally proposed. Do you think that's a good idea, or would that cause confusion? Well, Doug said he was uh, a little bit behind, actually. So I think and maybe I'm caught up. For I, I read up to chapter eight. I just didn't get a chance to reflect on it uh, right. as I had desired. Um, it, I, I guess it's just three of us: Donna, John, and I, who have not finished. And well, that's Donna's good. a little bit ahead, so I'd be fine with speeding it up. I know Katina has is on her second reading, so I don't think she would mind if she appears again. Um, I don't know that, what that would mean for our discussions. I, I, if we still keep the discussions in place, but just have knowledge that we're all aware, we're on the same page, and we don't have to worry about spoiler alerts or um, things like so that. We could maybe I'd be do, fine with it. Do a thing. I mean, Mary will be coming back for the second book, so I kind of I mean, we can we can tackle the beginning of the book when we get there, but uh, be nice to allow her to come back into the discussion. Uh, so I'd kind of like to keep to the rough schedule, but I have no objections if people want to read ahead and 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 we mix up the discussions a bit between sections. There's a lot to discuss, so I, I don't think we're going to run out of things to say. <laughs> I think by if we're meeting again in two weeks, I'll, I'll be done with the book by then. And um, so I, 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 I'm agnostic on changing the schedule or anything like that. I think that we could, I mean, even having finished the book, we could start to bring in other sources, other connections, yeah. expand the discussion. We can maybe um, revisit or reframe some of the questions that, that we've explored. Uh, I think that theology of Earthseed is fascinating. I think just a, discuss, a whole session on that would be really interesting. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to mention, since since I commute to work, I, I can't hold a book. So I, I searched for Octavia Butler on YouTube and there. Um, and I also have the book from the library. It's Blood Child. And the story is the book of Martha is what I read. And I feel that Gives, gives us an image of Octavia Butler as a writer. I think it was written later. I don't know the exact date because I did not research it like I wanted to. Uh, it's, it was a 40 minute listen. So, and I went and reread it and it's, it's maybe 20, 30 minute um, read. It's a short story, but it, it encapsulates more of the, her theology, I think, which we didn't discuss here. So it's, I'll, I'll post the link. Um, but I think it was written earlier, Doug. Uh, oh, the parable of the sower is her later writing, or, or the at least in the edition I have, I think it was added on as two extra stories. So it was, I think, Blood Child might have been published before, but then maybe in the reprint it introduced two more stories, which okay. the Book okay. of Martha was one. Okay. Okay. Uh, um, uh, uh, that that would be a very interesting development. And if we have time too, there's this book, Microcosmos, which is Lynn Margulis um, 
this is a book that Octavia Butler read, and it was very influential. Um, I'm also looking at Donna Haraway, Staying with Her Trouble, and she has an, another book also. And I think the, uh, and I'm, I'm looking at Bruce Clark, who's looking at neo-cybernetics neo and uh, narrative, and he's looking at Octavia Butler, Donna Haraway, and um, Lynn Margulis as e ecofeminists, and they have a very eminent, eminist, eminatist, is that the word for it? They're very eminent thinkers. Mm. Uh, and they're very, uh, so, I don't know about Butler, um, but certainly Donna Haraway and Lynn Margulis are very hostile to the transcendent um, in the terms that, you know, usually the, the platonic way we think of um, the transcendent. And um, Donna Haraway especially is hostile towards hero narratives. She's saying, why does, a, why does a hero, usually a guy, have to go out and fight the good fight and usually get killed in order to save the clan or the group or the tribe? And she's, she really intentionally wants to disrupt that, that impulse in, in literature to, to stop the hero narrative, a dominant narrative that she thinks is colossally unecological. So I think that's a very, and what are you gonna, what other kind of stories can you create when you start to cut out the hero? Because, you know, both uh, males and females are drawn to heroic uh, gestures in fiction. And in our popular culture, you see this in Wonder Woman, you know, it's very dominant uh, theme um, that women are coming into in the power and they can beat the shit out of any guy, you know? <laughs> but I think, um, what is this doing to our children, boys and girls, when they now see, oh, not only can the, can the men beat the crap out of everybody, but now the woman can do it too. Um, I just don't think this is planting seeds for a, a, an ecological world. And I think these are what the eco-feminists are sort of obsessed by. And I'm not totally convinced by this. I don't think you can have imminence without transcendence. And um, I think that... Uh, Efforts to just to cap, you know, to push forward one over the other is probably not a good idea. It creates a whole lot of trouble. Anyway, there's another. That's another sort of research project that could come out of reading this this novel, is is ecofeminism along with, and I think that that sort of fits in with theology, because um, it's really hard, I think, to uh, look at the the theology of this character that she's creating um, without taking into consideration. This, this kind of feminist, the feminist kind of views, which was drawing upon. Yeah. I, I'm happy to do that, John. I think the feminist issues are I, I directly relevant to Butler's writing. I mean, she's, uh, e e even if she herself was not fully at home with that context, but uh, I, I definitely think it's worth looking at. The, the Haraway book is one I've had in my, my, library since I think early discussions, but I still haven't had the time to read it because we're engaged with so many different things. I just don't have the time for it all. So it is on my must reading list, but I don't think I'll, so I'll have to rely on your cogent well, <laughs> discussions about it rather than read it myself. Well, I, think. I, ha I haven't read it either, but I've read a lot of other, I've read other of her books and I've followed a lot of her online stuff. So I'm just saying that, um, you know, we're just creating the conditions so that these uh, these thinkers can come forward. And uh, I really think the interplay of fiction and theory is, is of great interest to all of us. So um, if we have a little time at, left over, since we're reading this novel so quickly, some of us are, um, these kind of potential forms could start to be entertained. I'm not saying we need to add more books to our already huge book list. So I, I think there is, we have to find an ecology of practice here. Uh, Donna Haraway uses uh, the, 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 the letters SF, so, which stands for science fiction. It could also be speculative fiction and it could also be um, speculative feminism. And I think it can, she has a whole list of things it can mean, but it's sort of a catch-all for maybe some of these different uh, themes or writers, like, like you've mentioned, John Haraway, Butler. Um, and there's some, it's a, it's a very, to me, it's a very interesting um, 
area of thought. So I would love to explore it further. Yeah, that somewhere in chapter seven or eight, I'm trying to find where I had it, but it reminded me of, which we haven't read Donna Haraway, but she has the, the phrase, make kin, not babies. And there's one part where uh, Lauren says, how in the world can anyone get married and make babies with things the way they are now? That's the same philosophy there. And that, that one stuck in my mind because I recently had a child and um, she continues on. I mean, I know people have always gotten married and had kids, but now, now there's nowhere to go, nothing to do. A couple gets married and if they're lucky, they get a room or a garage to live in with no hope of anything better and every reason to expect things to get worse. So Lauren is searching for that, that kin, I suppose, maybe later on, but yeah. I like your, your project there, John. Um, who, Bruce Clark, you said he ties together Butler and- a Yeah, I, I have a couple of his books. He's really, he, he, the one that his most recent is Neo-Cybernetics and Narrative. And he writes, he comes out of a Bateson, uh, Bateson's views. So I think it's really, really interesting. And that he focuses so much attention on, on this eco-feminist eco movement is, is I think um, very interesting because it's influencing our culture quite a bit right now. If you look at Netflix and look at the movies, you know, you're just seeing these themes and motifs being played out uh, over and over again. Uh, so anyway, Let's, let's use all of our knowledge and use all of it well. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Doug, you mentioned Kin, because uh, Butler has another book called Kindred that was written after the parable of the sower. And uh, so it might, might, we might also, what's it, what's it, intertext, interread between Butler's different books as well. Um, you know, if anybody has the time to read them. But... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think maybe we made a go around today. I have another meeting at, at a uh, quarter after the hour and I have to move uh, across town to get there. So I'd be just as happy to finish up a few minutes earlier today. Great. So we can continue this in our forum and maybe some new themes or motifs will open up and we could develop them there for any other projects that might want to happen. Cause we do have a lot going on already. So mm -hmm. yeah. But that, that sounds good. Uh, Don, I'm, I, we haven't heard from Donna on the reading, though. I'm curious if there's anything uh, that would work better for you or what you're interested in. Um, no, I'm fine. I mean, if you want to speed the reading, I'm fine. I can finish it in two weeks. The book, it's easy, I mean, to go through the chapters. So I'm, I'm okay if you want to do um, speed up the reading. I have other books I'm reading at the moment, but it's fine. I can <laughs> squeeze. I mean, I can change the schedule. Yeah. Okay. The other books in Arabic, so <laughs> I'll leave well, them for later. <laughs> just to share with, with the group, yeah. um, you know, you you had suggested uh, this is would be not directly related to Oct Octavia Butler, but uh, a poem by uh, um, uh, Iraqi poet Badr Shakir Shakir Al Sayab. Mm -hmm. um, that's so correct. I, I did some research and we followed up and I messaged you and just to say that that's something that we could also develop. I would imagine it's not a very long poem. It could be one session mm -hmm. that we, that, you know, where we look at that uh, poem in particular and maybe read some other sources. There's not that much in English uh, by this author. So we would really be relying on you to, to help translate and set the context. Yes, it would be interesting actually to introduce him and the different themes. And historically, when he started writing in the mid fifties of last century, when um, we can say as a region, we were coming out of post-colonialism and how we as being were trying to um, identify our status in the world. So it's very interesting, I mean, and he had different themes. He relied on symbolism, on history, on culture. So yeah, I think it would be interesting to introduce him. Yeah, I would love that. Please do, do Donna, let's do that. <laughs> yes, I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> All right.
<laughs> well, let's let's maybe do that through the forum for the moment, and mm -hmm. um, we'll read. We'll we'll aim to finish the book for next week for the discussion, but then we will leave the following week open for a more extended discuss, discussion about Butler and con her connections to other other part of the field, other par other parts of the field, something like that. Mm. Does that sound mm. good? Sounds like a plan. Sounds good. Mm. Good. All right. Okay. Thank you so well, much. Well, thanks, everyone, okay. and see you in two weeks. Thank you. At least for this discussion. Thank you. I'll probably see many of you before then. But <laughs> <laughs> thanks a lot. Yeah.